Welcome to the Seed Family Podcast, where we explore natural homeschooling, gentle parenting, simple living, and family adventure. I'm Rachel Rainbolt, the Sage Family Mentor, coming to you from an island in the Pacific Northwest, where I live wild and free in connection with my hilarious husband and three growing sailors in our fixer-upper on the beach. So join us around the campfire and let's get living the family life of our dreams. This is episode 91, and today I'm here with Linda Murphy talking about declarative language. Linda is a speech-language pathologist and RDI consultant. She founded Peer Projects Therapy from the Heart, a clinic in Beverly, Massachusetts, dedicated to helping individuals of all ages and their families by using a positive, thoughtful communication style that emphasizes understanding, patience, respect, and kindness. Linda has been working with individuals with social learning differences for over 25 years. She leads trainings on the topic of social learning and has authored Declarative Language Handbook, Co-Regulation Handbook, and numerous articles. Linda lives north of Boston with her husband and their two busy, lovable boys. The communication chapter of the new Sage Mothering course is steeped and marinated in declarative language goodness. So if you're striving to integrate this style of communication into who you are and how you show up as a mother, come on in at sagefamily.com slash mothering. I have been encouraging families to use language like I'm noticing and I'm wondering for a decade after experiencing the power of that style of communication with my own children and then with the families I was supporting. And then I heard the term declarative language inside the neurodiversity space in the context of PDA. And I got so excited because this thing that was so near and dear to me was now like an actual thing and a book and a person I could talk to about it. (laughs) So welcome to the show, Linda. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Will you introduce yourself and share a bit about who you are and what you're passionate about? Yeah. um, So my name is Linda Murphy. I'm first and foremost a speech language pathologist. I've been in the field for over 20 years now, and I'm also a relationship development intervention consultant or RDI consultant which RDI is parent coaching program that just supports parents to help develop dynamic and successful communication with their kids and learners of all ages within natural environments. And what I'm passionate about is just thinking about our communication style and just noticing or rather knowing how important it is to, um, to think about what we say and how we say it. I think I say that a lot, but You know, even if I just think about going back to graduate school as a speech therapist, I think going out into the world of speech therapy, the assumption was maybe, oh, I have to get kids to talk Mm -hmm. and that would be my job. But very quickly in the field, you know, that didn't always feel great. And so when RDI brought me a different set of tools that just more so focused on what I can do differently to support kids to be their best or learners to be their best and for us to have really successful and sustained social connection and emotional connection. It really just was, for me, was just a breath breath of fresh air. It changed everything I did. And so this was, I became an RDI consultant in 2007. And so I think in my world, just a very big part of um, treating kids or supporting kids to communicate at that time was through ABA. I'm not an ABA provider. So I kind of had felt like I needed to forge my own path have a different voice, which wasn't always comfortable. Um, But I stuck with it. (laughs) And, uh, and here we are today that just, you know, like you said, just more people are aware of it, talking about it. I had been talking about declarative language since I learned about it in 2007 through the RDI community. And there really just wasn't a good tool out there or resource for families, for educators to know what it was and to know how powerful just small shifts in our speaking style can be. Um, so I just got brave and decided to write a book myself because <laughs> I just felt so dedicated and invested 
in this strategy as the big change that's positive for everybody. Well, thank you for your bravery. Thank you for your willingness to have uncomfortable conversations and be uncomfortable, make people feel uncomfortable in spaces in order to really like create more space for this style of communication that really is powerful and does make a huge difference. So let's get into that style. Declarative language is beneficial for everyone, though it is extra helpful for kids with social learning differences. What are social learning differences? Well, I like to think we all have different social learning styles. I might consider myself non-autistic or neurotypical. So therefore, some of the kids that I work with have different social learning styles than me. Neither is less than, they're just different. But diagnoses that we might hear out there that could fit into a category of different from from um, non-autistic or neurotypical might be autistic, um, individuals with ADHD, nonverbal learning disorders, the profile of PDA, like you had mentioned, those sorts of things, just where are those learners in the world sometimes, you know, might just experience greater challenge or not or not experience success as much as we would like to. So just as a speech therapist, those are the kids that find their way to me. That, that we want to support with their social communication. And I, you know, this is all like an evolution for me and how I think about things. And I think way back it was more, okay, kids come to me and I'm going to help them with their communication. But as I've gone along and where I'm at now is it's more so I want to help us communicate better with each other. And it's a two-way street. So it's not just their communication needs to improve. It's that my communication and understanding has to improve also to an equal amount so that we understand each other and have successful communication across different social learning styles. Yeah. I love that. I love how neurodiversity affirming it is. And it's like before, especially like as a trained clinician, you know, it's like, we're here and other people with these labels are down here and we need to reward or train them, you know, to come up here in order to get their needs met. And now we're saying, Hey, we're, we're all just (laughs) different (laughs) and Mm -hmm. where, where can, how can we get into an overlap? Like where we can connect with each other? Like, where's the space where we can both connect and get all of our needs met. And it just feels like such a respectful and it's a more effective, like, I think that's Mm -hmm. a big part of it too, is that, you know, even people who can be resistant to like the heart of it, you know, like the philosophy of it, the morals, the ethics of it, it's hard to argue with like, this works. Like, <laughs> like it's just more effective. So no matter like which angle you want to come at, it's like beneficial across the board. Right. Totally. Okay. Declarative language is recommended in contrast to the imperative language of demands that is often used with kids. Can you tell us more about how people are usually communicating with kids and why it's problematic? Yeah, I think Everybody does their best too. You know, we're all just trying to get where we need to be, get out the door, get things done. But I think what happens in life is we're busy and everybody needs to get a zillion places faster, or there's so many things that always need to get done. And so I think what ends up happening is we end up prompting our learners to do this, to do that, get this, get that, go there, do this. So caregivers or teachers might end up using a lot of imperatives, which is just commands or demands in the moment, telling a learner exactly what to do. And what happens is it places the demand telling them exactly what to do, but it also um, places the demand of time pressure, which can be really hard for kids, just an additional demand that... um, that just places places greater pressure on learners in the moment and can create stress, stress on that learner, stress in the relationship. And then none of us end up meeting the goal that we want. Or if we do get to the place that we want to be, we might not be happy (laughs) or we might feel grumpy towards each other or frustrated or misunderstood or impatient or, and the child may not feel competent or good either because They've been faced with a series of demands or they feel like I can't meet these demands. So I'm just going to fall apart. Yeah. When I had been speaking about this style of communication without knowing it was a thing, (laughs) I used to refer to it as positioning language because, you know, like we talked about before, like if you're up above someone and giving them a command that creates this relational dynamic, you know, that continues to play out and reverberate for hours afterwards. Whereas if you can use language to like position yourself 
you know, to actually reach the other person, to be in this like respectful connection with the other person. It just, it changes the whole atmosphere. Yeah. And I think like one thing to always keep in mind is just because you're using this respectful language doesn't mean that you're ever not the parent and you're still the main guide and caregiver in that moment, leading the way for the child, but while also giving them respect and space to be who they are so they can contribute equally to the exchange in a way that is meaningful to them. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to give some examples of imperative language, and I'm hoping you can walk us through turning them into declarative language, a little bit of practice for us today to help us Mm -hmm. like, you know, get those creative juices flowing, get the hang of this shift. So what do you need? Yeah. And um, one thing we didn't talk about, I'll just say it um, a little bit here is so imperatives, like we just said, are demands, but then there's also question asking, which also place demands. So what do you need? Although it's not a command, it does place a demand because it's asking the individual learner to come up with an answer at that moment in time. So, okay, for this one, I sometimes imagine we're get, we're trying to get out the door to get to school and the child maybe needs their backpack or their shoes or their coat. And then we say, what do you need? Placing that demand for them to come up with what it is that they need to pull together to get out the door successfully. So a declarative in that moment might be something like, you know, I I notice you don't have your backpack yet. Let's go find that together. Or I love those socks, but I bet we could find your shoes too and get those on. And it could be declarative language can sometimes invite the child to infer like, oh, I see you don't have your socks. I mean, I see you have your socks on, but you're missing something. And that might invite invite the child to infer or problem solve that they need their shoes. But it, declarative language doesn't always have to be at that level where we're asking kids to problem solve and infer. We could also just guide very directly with a comment. So I think you need your shoes or I notice your shoes are by the door. Let's get them together. So it can come in all different ways depending on the situation and maybe what your child or the learner is ready and open for at that moment in time, that will be a successful moment. Um, But at the end of the day, it's just switching from that demand-based language to a comment that guides or gives information or perhaps gives an opportunity to problem solve if that will be a successful opportunity for the child. Yeah. I, I like this example too, because what do you need it can feel very compassionate and respectful in theory, you know, like if my child is, is it, if I, if I'm observing something that clues me in that my child might be having some need, whether that be like a feeling or a physical need or whatever, and me checking in and saying like, Hey, what do you need? Like that, that on like, that seems great. And yet if our child is in a state or has a way of being in which that de- that is received as a demand, like that can create a lot of unnecessary stress where instead of saying, what do you need? Or even, are you thirsty? I can say like, oh, I'm noticing the sweat and the pink cheeks we both have. I'm going to get us some, or I'm going to get some water. And then I just say yeah. on the counter. Yeah. And you even made me think there's different types of examples with what do you need? Like it could be very routine based, like you got to get your shoes or it could be related, like you just said to a physical need or a personal need. And I love that you brought that in. Thanks for bringing that in because sometimes the the child might know what they need, like a a drink of water, like, oh, I'm thinking um, you might need a drink of water. You look thirsty, but, or what I meant to say was sometimes we might be able to recognize what they need. So they're sweating. And then we can say, you know, you look like you're hot. I, I think you need some water. Let me get that. But sometimes we truly might not know, like maybe they're upset and we're not quite sure what they need, in which case instead of what do you need again, which is places the demand, the declarative statement could be something like, I would really love to help you, but I'm just not sure what you need right now. So then we're bringing in our perspective, our concern, our desire to help and leaving space for the child to contribute or share with us what it is that will help them feel better if they do in fact know or have an idea. Yeah. And, and even sometimes like I'll take it like one tiny step further and say like, so I'll sit on the floor nearby in case anyone wants a hug or <laughs> like mm-hmm. you know, just, just like throwing out a random guess. But either way, like the phrasing of it is not placing this expectation that they are to produce an answer and there is likely a right or correct answer. Right. Okay. 
More yeah. examples. <laughs> Look at me. Yeah. So, um, so look at me. I think so for that one, like I, I would never, I don't ever want to say that to a child for lots of different reasons. It places a demand on them to make eye contact or look at something when in fact their processing system may not be ready for that new information. So I always just want to be really respectful and give kids or learners time and space to shift their visual attention for something important in a way that's comfortable to them. But saying that, of course, there's times when it is important for them to look because we want to share some information that's visual in nature. Um, so things that I might say are, you know, I have something important to show you when you're ready, or I'd love to show you something. You can take a peek when you're ready, something like that. But just where I let them know there's information that's important for them, but I'm not going to dictate when they shift their visual attention or take in that information because that's going to create stress. Nice. Yeah. I I remember working through even just the idea that in order to be it, for information to be received, there has to be eye contact, like such a neurotypical expectation. Like people who watch the video of this podcast might even notice when I'm really thinking about something, I look up like that's absolutely how I process. So when I'm listening to you, like I'm all in that eye contact, taking it in. And then when I think about when I start like accommodating it and actually processing it deeply, like right before I speak, I almost always look up and then like you start recognizing that in other people too. But so even just that expectation that eye contact equals right. listening and processing is a really neurotypical expectation. Right. Yeah. And I just think some kids, it's hard to listen and look at the same time. Yeah. Um, and if we ask them to do that, it will create stress. Yeah, they will listen less yeah. well. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and even, um, you know, sometimes I think that look at me is our, for our benefit, not the child, because it makes us feel good that they're paying attention. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're able to take in that information just because they're looking. Um, and if we, if our end goal really is to share information, then we have to respect their processing system and that um, looking and listening at the same time might be hard. Yeah. Buckle your seatbelt. So let's say, um, so if it's a, well, we're assuming it's a child that's old enough to do it themselves, right? <laughs> so, Even that assumption is yeah, one that like bears wrecking, like taking a minute to think about. <laughs> yeah. So if we think about an individual child that can do it on their own, um, I might say something like, um, I'm putting my seatbelt on right now. And, and I put on mine and that's my declarative statement just to model. Um, or I know we can drive as soon as everybody's seatbelt is buckled. Or I'm waiting for you to put on your seatbelt. Let me know when you're ready. Something like that. Yes. I had a buckle song that I always sang because <laughs> I picked up very quickly. And it's funny because I never... Like I just make up songs all the times for my kids. But when I reflect back on when do I make a song, it's usually when there was like a point in the routine that was triggering to them in some way or problematic, but which really it's like the command that I was giving was probably triggering or problematic for them. And all the little songs that I make up, like in hindsight, I see like, oh, they're all declarative language. Like my buckle song was like, it's buckle time. It's buckle time all the words in it, like all of the different phrases in it were declarative language. Like there were no demands. It was like, we're going to be safe in the car because it's buckle time. Like whatever the songs, they were all so funny, like yeah. not really doing that intentionally, but looking back, like the things that worked and the things that were actually helpful <laughs> whenever I would make a shift, it was always toward declarative language. Yeah. And one thing like your models get into this so much too. So I'll just comment on it. The other thing that's al always just really important for declarative language is your, your overall communicative presence and that it's positive and inviting or neutral, but not um, one of power struggle. So declarative statements can come off as negative if we don't bring that positive communicative presence. So that's mm -hmm. a really important part of it is, you know, we can't just say, I'm wondering if everybody has their seatbelt buckled. Yeah. That's declarative language technically, but it m misses the point because it's, it's a demand or it's snarky. Um, so we always want to make sure our tone of voice is positive or neutral. Mm -hmm. The pace of our words and language allows for processing time. 
Um, our nonverbal communication as much as we can is positive and inviting, non-judgmental, curious. Um, those things are all really important too in the bigger picture of this speaking style being successful. Oh, I love that. Yes. And when I wanted to like dial up the playfulness, we would sort of gamify it a bit. Like I would sing it really slowly and they would like move like they were underwater in slow motion or I would sing it really fast. That was probably their favorite is they would have to try and get the buckle done before I finished the buckle song. But like <laughs> turning up the playfulness and then being like, no, I can sing it faster or whatever. Like, like you said, like just sincerely bringing that like that positivity to it or, or even neutral sometimes. But if there's a negative, you know, stew <laughs> that mm -hmm. you're, you know, that you're sitting in, like they, they pick up on that and they feel that even if your words are technically like correct. Yeah. And um, if I may just mention a resource that's on my website yeah. while we're, you know, we just kind of mentioned it, but I did recently or over the past year create just guiding principles for using declarative language. And they're just on my website, declarativelanguage.com under free handout. Um, but it just lists, lists things that we can all keep in mind, such as our tone, our tone of voice, our nonverbal communication, um, processing, or allowing our learners time to think while we talk or mm -hmm. after we say something, that sort of thing. But um, just because I think it's just really important to always remember that that aspect of the communication style as well. Yeah. And we'll, we will definitely link to that at the end too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go over a couple more. Um, say hello to grandma. Yeah. So greetings are an awesome thing, but what makes greetings even better is when they're unique to the two people that are involved in it. So anytime we dictate how a child says hello to another person, it takes away that opportunity for them to forge their own relationship and connection. Yeah, genuine um, connection. <laughs> yeah. So in my book for this one, I say something like, I notice grandma is here or wow, grandma just walked into the room. So all you're really doing is commenting on the change in the environment, comments on the person that has arrived and quietly wait and just let that, that child figure out um, how they might want to greet grandma. So, you know, it could be a wave, it could be a hug, it could be saying, hi, grandma, but it's just nice if we don't decide or dictate what that unique greeting between those two people. I find that I'm helping people to be more set up for success when I like invite the other person, like grandma in this example, into the process and let cue them in, let them know in advance, um, like, hey, I'm... I, we're working on, on greetings and what sorts of greetings feel really loving and authentic for each relationship. And so I would love if you could like partner with us in creating the space to just like leave it be like, let it hang, let that space exist. And let's just like, see what comes up, you know, and see what we can, what we, what we discover and what we learn about ourselves and each other. And, and so that they don't, they don't sort of sabotage it a bit. <laughs> it's like, yeah, say hello, grandma's here. You know, like in my population, we know a lot about no forced hugs and things like that, like no forced affection. But I love that we can like take that invitation a little bit further even here. Yeah. And I think sometimes kids just need a little time to notice the change in the environment, to process that, and then come to the decision um, regarding how they want to greet, say hello, say goodbye. Uh, and I just think so often grownups don't give kids that time. It's just a very quick prompt to say hello, say goodbye. Uh, so even just that silence after saying, oh, it's it's time to go, I'm going to say goodbye to grandma. And then giving time and space for them to then notice the change, shift their thoughts, decide how they want to say goodbye can be really powerful. It's like the time is really important too. Absolutely. My oldest had a really hard time separating from my mom and they developed this whole system of the goodbye chocolate. My mom always kept one like tiny little like fun size chocolate thing in her purse. And that was like their big, like, you know, what's the opposite of greeting <laughs> departure? Like they're, they're like, uh -huh. you know, sort of loving ritual was like the exchange, you know, of that, like the gifting of that little piece of chocolate. I love that. That's so sweet. 
Yeah. And like, I, I mm-hmm. would have never come up with that. You know, I would have never thought of that. And it just sort of developed naturally between the two of them. And it was this really special thing and not with any of my other kids. Like that wasn't their genuine, yeah. you know, connection. Yeah. And I think when you use declarative language to what ends up happening is you just really see the beauty of dynamic communication, which means things develop authentically, naturally in a way that's unique to the two people. And there's so often times that I may be thinking one thing, but when I make a comment and then leave space, the child comes in with a different idea or thought. That is wonderful. But if I don't ever leave that space, then you don't get to that beauty, which is authentic dynamic communication. So even that greeting with the chocolate, like how nice is that? How cool is that? But if you were dictating what the greetings look like, they never would have found that themselves. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Some other examples. It's hard to narrow it down. Um, Pick up your coat. Um, Something like, I see your coat on the floor. Um, I'd love to pick up your coat. How about we do it together? Um, it could be something like, Hey, I'll grab your, your coat and, um, hand it to you and you can hang it where it goes. If you want to bring in partnership a little bit, so something like that, again, it just always is going to vary on the learner where they're at in the moment, that moment in time. Um, cause even if you say, Oh, I see your coat on the floor, like that's a great declarative comment, but if they're not in a place to pick it up, you know, then it becomes, okay, how do I how do I get it up off the floor without creating a power struggle around this? And that's when I might pull in language, declarative statements that create partnership. So let's do it together so it doesn't get dirty. Yeah. I think even as a parent, like even if we're doing four, saying it out loud gives me sometimes like the recognition (laughs) with the universe that I need in order to feel good about doing it, which might sound silly, but I find this, I mean, true, even with older kids, like all this stuff, a lot of the examples we're using are kind of younger kids stuff, but like just this weekend with my teenager, he was in a really like high and stress, super intense moment. And there was all this equipment that had to move from one place to the other. And I just said out loud with him near me, (laughs) I see all this equipment that needs to get loaded. So I'm going to start loading it. And I, I know this about myself, that if I had said nothing and just done all of that work myself, it's like a hundred degrees outside. I'm hot. It's the end of a long week. Like I might have built up some resentment, but somehow saying it out loud and him seeing that and hearing that, that changes the whole emotional temperature inside of me. Yeah. Yep. And, and him, he didn't feel like you were nagging him. You were truly his partner in the moment to accomplish a shared goal, Yeah, which always feels better. Similar to the pick up your coat. Um, I was thinking sometimes you can be jokey too, if you feel like it will, it will be helpful. So say it's a shirt on the floor near the hamper. Um, and actually when I did a training once, this was somebody in the, in the audience that was their idea. So I don't want to take credit. I just loved it. (laughs) But he said something like, Oh, your shirt is missing. It's buddies in the hamper or the shirt on the floor is so lonely. He's missing his friends in the hamper. So you could even just be playful and silly and jokey. Um, And again, that brings in that positive tone that keeps it about your connection, your emotional connection together versus a power struggle or a demand. Absolutely. I remember one time with my youngest, because his dirty laundry kept getting all over his floor in in a playful way. We were joking about, okay, where do we have to put the hamper so that the clothes get there on accident? So we like every day we would like move it to a different place, like just to see, like and put it, putting it in ridiculous, silly places and, you know, trying it out. And yeah, just that, I don't know. I feel like declarative language can unlock a lot more playfulness, which is really hard to access when you're in command mode. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the benefits. What are some of the benefits to declarative language? Well, I think, you know, we we started to talk about a lot of them. It it I think on the ground level, it shifts your communication dynamic from one that might be negative to one that's positive. It moves it from demand based or our struggles to connection and partnership. So just on that ground level, it just flips the communication landscape from negative to positive, which allows space for so many other things to build over time. Um, so that's usually what happens first, I think, and what 
people start to see is just like, oh, it feels so much better to communicate. We're not arguing. We're not, um, there's no power struggle here. We're together. This is really nice. And then, um, and then what happens is kids become more open to information. They might become more open to being guided in the moment around new information or a new skill that you might want to be helping them with because they know you're not going to place demands on them before they're ready or demands that they can't handle. So they might become more open to being vulnerable, more open to guidance. You know, all these things just get really important as you get older because that's really what what self-advocacy is about is being open and being okay with being vulnerable and knowing when you need help. So it starts to get at that. I think when our when our communication is demand-based, kids don't open themselves up to this. They don't want to be vulnerable. They just have their shield up really high and they're fearful to need help or be, be vulnerable. So declarative language starts to get at that really nice, that really nice dynamic, beginning of self-advocacy skills, self-awareness. Um, and then and then just skill development. So it might be problem solving, it might be um, noticing things in the environment or situational awareness that are important. You know, over time, kids become more resilient. They're able to handle uh, mistakes more easily or maybe more e- more able to take responsibility when things don't go the way that they had hoped. Um, so all sorts of things. And I know um, in my book, in Declarative Language Handbook, I have a chapter on just five different areas of social learning that that I think about right away, that declarative language really helps to foster. Um, so people can refer to that too. But um, observation, um, problem solving, or episodic memory is, is one. It's just where we use memories to support our problem solving in the here and now. We can reflect on the past and find a similar but different situation. As I said, being okay with mistakes, thinking in alternatives. Um, and let me just think. My fifth one, I'm going to read them. Oh, and appreciating a different opinion. So mm-hmm. ultimately, it, you know, we want to help kids be able to appreciate where other people are coming from and, and different perspectives. But where we can even start is just helping kids appreciate different opinions with declarative language because they become more open to what other people might be thinking or feeling at any given moment because they don't have that guard up in the same way. Yeah, we get to relate to them as allies, like positioning yourself as an ally. I, that, like now having kids, so my kids like today are 17, 15, and 11. And a lot of these things that I invested in heavily when they were younger, like I can really see which of those things has like made big impacts now, sort of on the other end. And that, positioning myself as an ally, particularly now that two of them are teenagers and one is launching. And (laughs) that really has been huge bang for my buck. Like it's, it's especially, it's absolutely possible to go back and change or not to go back, but it's absolutely possible to shift and change things at any point. And like, it's so wonderful, like wherever you are in the journey to start now and like, you know, make those changes. Cause when you plant those seeds and those roots, you know, start to grow, like it really does bloom some amazing benefits and some amazing things. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, my kids are 11 and 14 and I like to think we always have good, positive communication. There's things that we can talk about. Um, I practice declarative language with them a lot. I hear them using it now too, just to problem solve together, to wonder together, to self-advocate at times. Um, but I also think you're exactly right that it's never too late. Yeah, I've worked with um, with parents and caregivers of teenagers, of even adults, like adult children, um, and it's never ever too late to to change to change up your communication style and to see the benefits of it. Yeah, I find it really yeah. powerful too. Like as even just as an adult in life, I often talk with people about spheres of ownership, like what's yours to own and what are other people's to own. And that plays into like boundaries, conversations and all kinds of things. But like what's within your control? What do you own? And declarative language is actually super helpful in keeping me clear on that because I am speaking to the things that I am noticing, that I'm willing to do, the things that are happening, the thing like it really does it 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 lines up with that very nicely. Like I'm not trying to force someone else to do something with my words and in the way that sort of the mainstream approach kinds of sets us up to to think 
especially as moms, that like our sphere of ownership is this big <laughs> mm-hmm. when really it's like this big. <laughs> right. Yeah, I totally agree. And that is that's something you can always say like declarative language is amazing because we can own it. It's our communication style. Yes. So the change happens here with me, but that also is hard because it might be different where we're letting go of trying to get kids to do something and just owning our own communication. Yeah. Like being successful, quote unquote, with this is not dependent on your child doing anything different per se. Like you can just show up differently. Right. Yeah. 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 And I think, I know we've said this, but the success is that you feel that connection or your relationship changes to be one that positive and open. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to share an example of each of your five areas of social learning fostered by declarative language. And I know that we talked about this in the um, benefits, but I want to touch on some examples of each of them because I think it is really important in understanding like how this shift impacts, you know, the, the individuals and the systems and the relationships and all of that. So visual referencing, um, the example is you're sitting on the pieces. Can you explain what visual referencing is and what's happening if I say you're sitting on the puzzle pieces? Yeah. And this is, this is funny because this is a video clip of me with my kids that I show when I do trainings, <laughs> but basically, um, so as we talked about a little bit before, it, it is important for us to all observe our environment and notice things that are important or meaningful at any given time. Um, and I like to use the term visual referencing just to mean we're picking our head up, we're checking in on the context, the environment, maybe the people that we're with to notice their nonverbal communication. So it's different from eye contact, which is just maybe looking. Visual referencing is using our sense of sight to gather information. So in the example that you just mentioned, um, I'm about to play a game. This is when my kids were a little bit younger with both of them, or I'm inviting them to see who would like to play, but one of them is sitting on top of the pieces that we're going to need. And so I just say to it, I just say to him, um, your body's on top of the pieces. And then I give him time to process because that was important. And he was looking at a toy. And then after a couple of seconds, he says, huh? And he picks up his head. He visually references the environment, his surrounding environment. He notices he's sitting on top of things that we need. And then he moves his body back. So what happened in that moment is he really just observed the environment Um appreciated the bigger picture. So here's my body in space. Here how it's maybe getting in the way of somebody else's plan that's right with me. <laughs> Let me be a problem solver and scoop my body back so they can have what they need. Uh, so it's just that little comment, commenting on his body at that moment in time, which invited him to reference and problem solve. So that's very different. I contrast that with the imperative, which would have been something like move back. Yeah. So the move back wouldn't would have told him exactly what to do, but it wouldn't have invited him to put all those pieces together in the big picture and be the problem solver, access even that higher level thinking in the same way. So it's just these little nuanced changes in our um, language that can really create amazing learning opportunities for our kids. But again, as we've been saying, it starts with me and what what I do and me being mindful in the moment to pause and think about what I want to say and how I want to say it so that I can give him that learning opportunity in the moment. Yes. Gosh, I just, I think last night I was saying, you're bumping my leg. (laughs) And and it was, you know, it wasn't, I love how it gives them the opportunity to come into your level of awareness to notice, like you said, how their body is sort of where their body is at in time and space and how it's moving through time and space. And then he gets to, or the child or the person then gets to walk away from that experience feeling so not only empowered, but also really like generous and caring and compassionate because it was their agency that led to a change as opposed to if I had said something like move back, like then there's like Mm -hmm. sort of shame that gets triggered in that. Right. Whereas like, Oh, you're bumping against my knee. Then they get to notice that. And it's like, Oh, I'll move my, you know, my thing over. I'm so, you know, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? Me or whatever. And then moves over and like, he feels wonderful. Whereas ouch, like Mm -hmm. move back like that. Then there's shame. Like it just, 
such right. a small shift, like just right. really changes the trajectory. Right. Right. And you're just inviting that, that child to uh, make an adjustment in their own actions. Yeah. Which is empowering. Yeah. Or even explaining yeah. what my actions are. So like, if I say, yeah. oh, you're bumping my knee, I'm going to move over. Even that gives an, instead of me just moving and then never having that right. awareness. Yeah. Right. Right. And I was going to say, um, it, it also gives the child that opportunity to show that they care and have yeah. empathy for the other person. So, you know, if somebody's bumping something, it, it might be that a grown up comes in quickly and says, stop that or don't do that or you're bugging your friend and assumes that the incorrectly that the child is doing it on purpose or doesn't care about their friend. But when we use that comment and then give that space, um, we get to see who they really are and that they really do care and they do have that that empathy for other people. Um, but we have to give them that space to show to show us. Like that's yes. the really important piece. piece. Yes. I so often see like a lack of awareness um, of more subtle cues or even impulsivity attributed to a lack of empathy, which when I know the child, like I can see how that's not consistent, you know, with what I know of the child, even in very short times when I'm working with families. So like reframing those stories that we're telling, like declarative language can help give you that, those additional like data points to, to reframe those stories. Mm -hmm. And to give, yeah. And it gives the child the benefit of the doubt. They are a good person who care about other people. Yeah. Um, and if we give them that space to repair, they probably will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Episodic memory. I remember um, this has happened before and we figured out a good plan. I'm wondering if you remember too, what's going on there. Yeah. So episodic memory, which I know we talked about this briefly um, a couple of minutes ago. So basically, you know, we all have a series of memories across our life of experiences. And anytime we're in a new situation, we, you know, if we have, um, if we can easily access that episodic memory, we can think back to a similar but different time and figure out what to do in the here and now or how to navigate that. I think sometimes for our kids, it can be hard for them to access that similar but different <laughs> um, plan that they used in the past for lots of different reasons. So when we use a declarative statement to just to connect the dot, we support that that memory retrieval, which will then solidify it. Um, even more for the next time around. So I remember this happened before and we figured out a good plan. I'm wondering if you remember too, and it's very possible we could give the child time and space to see if they do remember too, but they might not, in which case we just want to then continue on with more declarative statements where we share our memory out loud. Well, what I remember when this happened is when, you know, such and such broke, we ended up getting some glue from the cabinet and we glued it back together. We could give that a try again here if you'd like. So you're just just helping that narrative over time solidify uh, so that it's more easy for them to retrieve that similar but different plan in a future opportunity. So, you know, you're always using declarative language. Um, it's a very future-based language too. So we're retrieving memories from the past and laying it out in the here and now with the intention of knowing it'll be there for tomorrow. Hmm. Um, you know, it, it's like yeah. we're I the one way I talk about it is we're just always building a narrative over time with our kids. We're planting a seed in the here and now so that it'll be there tomorrow. And if it's not there tomorrow, easily retrievable, it's okay. I'm going to support that retrieval of that memory so that it'll be there in the next similar but different opportunity and just trust that it will develop or unfold over time. But we want to really be able to use that declarative language to kind of lay that narrative down for kids so they can see that those patterns as well. Um, yeah. Oh, it sounds God. complicated, but I think like the more you get into it, it's not, it's just yeah. becomes your speaking style. And no, it's, it's, it's totally here. not complicated. Yeah. <laughs> and we're just sort of diving deep because like my audience is nerdy and they want, they want, like yeah. they want to understand it. And they'll, I know they're yeah. soaking this up right now. So appreciating mm-hmm. different opinions. We think differently about that. This might be my favorite yeah. one because I have a kid for whom this was a challenge. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think different opinions can feel scary to kids. 
um, you know, if they, if they, just taking in new or different information can be hard for them to acclimate to or to figure out, like, where does that fit in my understanding of the world? And their guard might go up quickly so that they resist the new or different information. So again, like, it's not that they're not flexible or don't want to grow. It's just that new information can sometimes be scary because I don't know what to do with that. So when we say things like, when we just observe and recognize the difference in the moment and just use a declarative statement to just be together in space, thinking different things and acknowledging that, it can just really start to help kids feel okay sharing space with people who think differently. Like, it's okay that we have a different thought about that. It doesn't mean that we're any less connected. It just means we have different thoughts about this. I like this and you like that. It's really, isn't that cool? Like maybe that would be the expan- the expansion of it would be, yeah, we think differently about this, but doesn't that make our friendship so interesting because I can learn from you even though we think different things about this. So it just makes it safe to be together with your different thoughts. <laughs> oh, the world is, this is the one that I feel like the world needs most I know, right now. <laughs> I know, we really do. It's true. Okay. Making mistakes is okay. Oops. I took a wrong turn. I need to turn the car around. It's okay. We will still get to where we need to be. Yeah. So I think a lot of our learners are really um, sensitive about their own mistakes. They don't want to make mistakes. They feel a lot of anxiety around it for lots of different reasons. And so we can really use a lot of declarative language just to model the mistakes that we make. I think it helps normalize it. Um, You know, we all do things that are not quite right, but the important part isn't that we're perfect. The important part is that we repair or get in there and figure out um, what we need to do to make an adjustment or fix a mistake in the moment. Like that's where it's at. I think even as we grow and learn, it's not important that we get it right. It's important that when we maybe are off a little bit, we can figure out what to do to navigate, to get back on track. So, so yeah, so anytime we make mistakes or mess up, if we can say it out loud to our kids, it just helps them know everybody does this <laughs> and it's really okay. And ultimately we want them to just feel safe when they make a mistake and know that it's okay. Yeah, I was in the car with another adult just the other day and they had made some wrong turns and were getting very stressed out. <laughs> I just said, it's okay, we'll get there in the end. And like the whole the whole temperature got turned way down. And then suddenly yeah. it's like, oh, we're just ha- enjoying a nice day together. Well, you know, we'll get there eventually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like right. just such a, like saying just such a small thing, even to another adult again, because we're talking about how like you can use this right. in your whole life um, makes a huge difference. Like right. giving someone else permission to make a mistake, you know, by yeah. making clear that for me, this is not causing harm. Right. Yep. It can be regulating to everybody. Yeah. Okay. Thinking in alternatives and possibilities. Hey, I have a funny idea for dinner tonight. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, so that leads to probably curiosity and being able to think in a different way. You know, a child might be used to having a particular thing for dinner every Monday night or something. And if you say, Hey, I have a fun idea. Like, I think what that does for me is it creates curiosity and wonder where the child that can then um, invite that information at a pace that they're ready. They might say, well, what is your funny idea? <laughs> um, and then you can guide them down a different path that may be different than they expected, but it's not with pressure. You know, you could share that idea and maybe you could do it. Maybe not. Maybe you could brainstorm further ideas together to find something that's better for both of you. Um, but it's just showing that there's different different things to think about. There's always more than one way to do something or to think about something. Yeah, I think these last two like sort of play on each other well sometimes too. And that particularly for children who have a lot of anxiety, um, sort of removing the fear of failure while presenting like an alternative in a playful way, like those two combine really well. Like um, if you have siblings who, you know, moving from point A to point B, there will often be a lot of emotional dysregulation because competition like will keep showing up and they'll be afraid of losing and things like that. You know, you can 
sort of present it like, hey, I have a funny idea. Why don't we walk to the car backwards today? And whoever is the slowest is the winner, you know, like being, <laughs> being, being just silly, like being playful like that, but sort of breaking down that fear of failure, like making the point to suck at something or like when introducing new foods, like I bet it's going to be so gross. I bet I bet I'm going to spit it out into my napkin first. Like I, I bet it's going to be slimy. I bet, do you think it'll be bitter? Oh, you think it's going to be bitter, right? Like that, those Brussels sprouts we've tried once. Oh my gosh, those are the worst. Like when you can really play up sort of the failure of it while like inviting alternatives and new possibilities. <laughs> I find that that really helps kids, especially with anxiety. Yeah, definitely. We hold the awkward silent space for processing after making a declarative statement. Therapists are well-versed in this, <laughs> the power of the awkward silence. Why is that hard yet important? Yeah, well, part because life moves fast and I don't know, I, I feel like someone, we always just feel like we have to fill in the space and keep it moving. But it's so very important because that's where the good stuff happens for our learners. Like that's in that silence is when they are starting to process. You know, we talked about, for example, um, visual referencing. So we might make a statement and then in that moment, we want them to be able to take in visual information related to the context or a communication partner. Um, so we make a statement and we invite them to take in that information, or we make a declarative statement, which guides them to pull an episodic memory that's similar, but different. So declarative language is just guiding our learner to do um, another thought process that might be higher level. And if we don't give time, then we're not going to, then they're not going to be able to do it adequately. Uh, so for me, it's just so, so, so important to just give that pause on the other side of it so that we give their little brains time to integrate the pieces, to recall a memory, um, whatever it might be. I have, um, on my website, I have a blog post called uh, Cognitive Rigidity Versus Processing Time, because mm -hmm. I think, you know, we can be quick to say, oh, so-and-so is so rigid because they don't want to do things in a different way. But I really believe it's not that they don't want to. It's just that we're not giving them time, adequate time to integrate that new piece of information mm -hmm. and, and figure out how does that fit in my current understanding of the world. And just because we can maybe do it quickly doesn't mean our learners can. And if, and if we don't give them that time and space, um, then, then stress, I guess, stress responses can happen. Yeah. Um, but to be the most powerful or, or for declarative language to be most effective, we really have to be mindful of our pace and give that and be okay with that awkward silence on the yeah. other side of it. I love like having a word for that too. Like you call it pacing. I love that, that pacing. And without it, like you said, it really creates a lot of that stress response too. Cause the kids, even if we're not saying the words, they are still, you know, neuroception, they are picking up on that rush, that pressure. Um, and that like really builds up the anxiety, which creates a wall for them to not take in that new information like you were talking about. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Co-regulation is something we have talked about in the polyvagal theory episode in the context of nervous system regulation, but you integrate a slightly different version of it. How does co-regulation go hand in hand with declarative language? Yeah. So the definition that I think about is in Alan Fogel's book, Developing Through Relationships. So co-regulation with the nervous system does align with this because it just means be present in the moment to that person that you're with so that you know how you want to respond in a way that's supportive. Um, but as a speech language pathologist or an RDI consultant, um, you know, I'm also thinking about dynamic communication. And so when I take that further to think also about not just regulation in the moment, but dynamic communication. It just means that I have to be present in the moment to my learner and respond with my communication in a way that is contingent to their communication. So it also kind of goes with pacing. Like I can't get too far ahead of that learner because then I'm no longer being contingent to them in the moment. It's my agenda versus us together. And so the way that I talk about it in, in um, my other book, Co-Regulation Handbook, is that as we create successful communication opportunities or even opportunities for learning, we always want to think about just competent roles for kids 
that are contingent on ours um, and authentic. I know we've talked about authenticity a little bit, you know, and this is just a framework that I talk about in the book and I don't need to get into it here, but if we enter with uh, competent, authentic, contingent roles in mind, that helps kids join and not feel anxious because sometimes kids don't join because they don't feel competent. So if we're always thinking about what's a competent role for them, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and our language also just highlights that competence or our connection to, e to each other in the moment. Um, and I think you had asked me too, just how do these go together? I think the way, like I never don't use one without the other, or I'm always kind of going back and forth between when am I using a declarative statement versus when do I need to pull in that competent, authentic, contingent roles a little bit more to sustain our engagement over time. But the way I think about them going together is declarative language is a way of speaking, but co-regulation is a way of being. Mm -hmm. So I have to be with my learner in the moment, but then my language and communication also matters. So I know exactly what to say to guide and connect us as we go. So co-regulation is kind of my my mindset as I create up as I um create interaction opportunities or learning opportunities. And then declarative language keeps us all connected through our language too. <laughs> that is beautiful. Yeah, your co-regulation book is the next one on my list. <laughs> <laughs> and I might have to try to convince you to come back again so we can dive even deeper on that topic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the show notes can be found at sagefamily.com slash podcast 91, where you can also subscribe and get future show notes sent right to your inbox. What, Linda, are your favorite resources for people to dive deeper into this topic of declarative language? Yeah, I think if you go to declarativelanguage.com, that's my main website. And I have um, I have a blog and lots of blog posts there. I have them by different categories. So there's some related to challenging behaviors, some related to episodic memory, some related to peer interaction, some that are about skill building and co-regulation. So you can kind of find a lot there. Um, I have handouts there, as I said. There's opportunities for coaching, parent coaching. We have classes every so often. Or if you're a professional or would like to share this information with professionals in your child's life, I definitely do trainings um, for teachers or professionals out there, you know, who want to just have a little mindset shift in how we approach our learners and create competence and engagement and emotional connection. Wonderful. I'm going to link to all of those things. And anyone who hasn't read her declarative language handbook, I highly, highly recommend it. It's actually a really easily digestible read. Like I felt like I was, you know, some books I read are very meaty <laughs> mm -hmm. and yours felt so easy, <laughs> like very much a fresh of a breath of fresh air on my bookshelf. Um, so thank you for making this really important thing so easily accessible. I thoroughly enjoyed the book and I want everyone out there to read it. Yeah, thank you. And I think that definitely is my goal. It's just what, like we're on the ground, what do we need to do? <laughs> yes. You know, it's great to read the theories or you know, I'm a big nonfiction reader or reading about polyvagal or whatever it might be mm -hmm. so that I can understand it. But I know people just need tools on the ground and need to know what to do. So that was my angle when I wrote it. Just what do you need to do to get started right away, I think is even one of the first chapters. So yes, you nailed it. Your intention is received fully. <laughs> thank you so much, Linda, for all of your work and for joining us here today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and letting me be a part of your community. It's an honor.